Matthew Spaulding, Associate Vice President and Dean for Hillsdale College here in Washington, D.C. Welcome to the Allen P. Kirby Center for Const uh, Constitutional Studies and Citizenship. Uh, as you know, Hillsdale College is an extension, excuse me, the Kirby Center is an extension of Hillsdale College, and we teach here in Washington, D.C. We have our undergraduates, one of whom will introduce our speaker today, uh, and others we try to teach. And in this place especially, we try to teach them how to think about politics and how to think about politics in a way that um, uh, evokes and is, is uh, evokes a sense of statesmanship and statecraft and is also appropriate for recovering American ideas. Uh, that in turn begs a question. How does one prepare for statesmanship? Can it be taught? Um, how does one form statesmen? An education question. We have a wonderful speaker who's going to address that today. Uh, as is our tradition, we have a student to introduce our speaker. Uh, Emily uh, DePanger is a sophomore at Hillsdale College. She's from Los Gatos, California. Uh, she's a politics major and a minor in classical studies. And on campus, she is in our honors program, a George Washington fellow, and the mock trial team uh, member. And she's currently interning for Congressman Tom McClintock. Emily. Thank you, Dr. Spaulding. James Pearson is a senior fellow and director of the Manhattan Institute's Center for the American University and president of the William E. Simon Foundation, a private grant-making foundation with interests in education, religion, and the challenges faced today by today's youth. He serves on the executive advisory committee of the Graduate School of Business at the University of Rochester, on the board of visitors at at Pepperdine University School of Public Policy and on the Advisory Council of the Henry Salvatore Center for the Study of Individual Freedom at Claremont McKenna College. Pearson is a distinguished writer who argues in his 2007 book, Camelot and the Cultural Revolution, that the Kennedy assassination is, quote, a case study in public mythmaking and the ways in which images and symbols can override facts and substance in political life, end quote. He is also the author with Jane, Jay Sullivan and G. Marcus of Political Tolerance and American Democracy. He has published articles on higher education and political philosophy in numerous academic journals and magazines, including the New Criterion, the American Political Science Review, the Wall Street Journal, the Weekly Standard, and the National Review. Pearson holds a PhD in political science from Michigan State University and has taught government and political theory at Iowa State University, Indiana University, and the University of Pennsylvania. He lives with his wife and son in Sleepy Hollow, New York. Please join me in wel welcoming Dr. James Pearson. Thank you. Thanks. Well, I appreciate that, Emily. I'm not sure I can live up to that introduction, but you're very kind. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here at Hillsdale among uh, friends and sympathetic uh, faces. Uh, I love the artwork that you have here. Uh, the Founding Fathers at the Convention in Philadelphia, that's a great painting. And that looks like Madison, I guess with George Washington. Uh, and that is an instruction in statesmanship in itself because as Lynn Cheney writes in her biography of Madison, Madison was about five feet four and Washington about six feet two. Jefferson was about six feet two, I think. And all those men looked to Madison to make the arguments uh, that got the Constitution ratified uh, because they so respected uh, Madison's intellect and mastery of the situation. And he was a wonderful debater. So uh, that's a kind of a sign, uh, something that the founding teaches us, that. Uh, intellect, preparation, and thought can overcome a lot of obstacles and win a lot of important battles. <clears throat> In terms of education, uh, I'll say that none of us uh, gets the edu education or has the education we really want. I remember sitting uh, with Victor Davis Hanson a few years ago at a lunch and I said to Victor, I said, boy, I really admire the fact that you studied 
all these classical histories and classical languages when I was immersed in contemporary issues as a political scientist. And Victor came back at me and said, you know what? I feel like I missed out on a lot by not studying contemporary history. I was so immersed uh, in ancient languages that I, I found that I didn't understand the modern world. So I, I take from that the thought that for our education, we can't just rely on the schools. It's a continuing thing. We have to continue to confront the issues of the day, continue to read, continue to learn, uh, to get the education that eventually we deserve. So our question today is, what was the education of the founders? Uh, can it be recovered today? And more problematically, uh, can we make it effective today in the midst of current controversies? Undoubtedly, we can replicate that education. You're doing it here. Hillsdale does it. Claremont does it. In some ways, Columbia University does it. Not as well, because the faculty at that institution is not as dedicated to the great books curriculum as they are at Hillsdale and Claremont and other places. But yes, we can uh, replicate that, as I'll try to suggest here today. But I think the, the larger issue is how can we take that education out into the world that we face and make it effective? As to the founders, uh, there were uh, three main or dominant strains of thinking uh, in the late 18th century when the revolution occurred and the Constitution was written and ratified. The first, of course, that we're, we know so well is the so-called Whig or Republican tradition of limited government that we inherited from the struggles in Great Britain for parliamentary supremacy in the 17th century. And of course, John Locke is the principal expositor of that so-called Whig doctrine. Uh, there were uh, various thinkers and pamphleteers who were important uh, in that period in articulating the doctrines of limited government, but Locke was the central one. Uh, indeed, that famous phrase, we hold these truths to be self-evident in the Declaration, it's almost a direct quote uh, from Locke's second treatise in government. And the separation of powers uh, in the Constitution, the idea of a right to revolution, uh, the idea of natural rights and a social contract, all these were somewhat embedded in the thinking of the founding fathers and incorporated into our institutions. The contract theory that Locke articulated was ridiculed in England in that period in the 18th century by David Hume uh, more than anyone else because, as Hume said, there is no uh, record in history of any such contract of recurring, so therefore we can't trace uh, obedience to government to any original contract. However, in America, we can plausibly say that our government originated in something that resembles an original contract. So uh, in that sense, uh, the American experiment is a locking experiment in almost a pure form. This is why we call it a founding. Now, the problem with Locke's doctrine is that from a moral or political point of view, it's somewhat thin. It's a political doctrine. Natural rights, equality, right of revolution, these are public ideas. But how does one orient one's private life to those ideas? We can have natural liberty, but how do we use our liberty? That's a, that's a kind of a question that Locke and the 18th century Whigs don't exactly answer. However, they did have traditions of thought to lean on outside of Locke. And those two would be Protestant Christianity, that would be one, and the second would be classicism, the thinking of ancient Rome and Greece, but principally of the founders, ancient Rome. 
uh, and especially the Roman Republic. That was a kind of a model uh, for the, the founders, a kind of mine of uh, examples that they drew on as they formulated uh, the Constitution and before that as they carried out the revolution and led it. <clears throat> now surprisingly, one would think that these two streams of thought, Protestantism and classicism, would be in conflict because the ancient Romans and Greeks worshiped these pagan gods. They weren't Christians at all. Uh, so you would think that uh, they wouldn't be compatible. And there are many who said they were not compatible. But the Protestants uh, tend to define classicism uh, compatible because they, uh, first of all, they wanted to rediscover Christianity in a pure form. That required them to leap back to the original sources of Christianity uh, while uh, in the early centuries of the, of the Christian era when the church operated in a purer form. So Protestants tended to ransack documents and history to try to authenticate their view of the origins of Christianity. And therefore, they were, they were sympathetic to uh, inquiries into the ancient world. The Protestants also believed that the rediscovery of the ancients in the 13th and 14th century paved the way for the Reformation. And so uh, they were somewhat friendly uh, to uh, the ancient world. So in that period, the, in the 18th century then, these two traditions of thought, Protestantism and classicism, were taught in the colleges uh, of the American colonies. Uh, now, as I said, from a secular standpoint, the history of the Roman Republic provided uh, a rich mine for political education of 18th century Americans and people in Great Britain as well. The battle between the plebeians and the patricians was cited in the Federalist Papers as a kind of a model uh, for the battle between the rich and the poor. And the great Romans who defended the Republic, uh, Cicero, uh, Cato, Publius, Cincinnatus, they provided models for political virtue. What did that mean? It meant sacrifice for the public good. It meant a form of modesty. It meant courage. It meant rhetorical skills. Um, and uh, disdain for personal honors. All these things, were, uh, the, um, the American founders found examples of in, in the world of ancient Rome, indeed. They used these names as pseudonyms for the pamphlets they published. The Federalist was Publius, one of the founders of the Roman Republic. The Romans celebrated the founders of new orders, and they celebrated the founders of the Roman Republic. And the fall of the Republic was taken as a cautionary tale as to what might happen to republics if, they should, if the people should lose their virtue and the government uh, lost in corruption. Uh, so young Americans who attended college in that era learned all these streams of thought. Now, in the colonial period, and to a surprising degree, America was really shaped by colleges. I don't want to exaggerate that, but colleges were very important in that era to a degree that they have never, they were not until the post-war era in which we're now living. Uh, why was that? Well, uh, there's a very interesting book by David Hackett Fisher. Many of you have seen it. It's called Albion Seed. It's a terrific book in which he traces the migrations uh, to America in the 17th and 18th century. And basically, these migrations from England were generated out of the upheavals that were then taking place in England. And so different groups fled England for America depending upon what was happening in England. So the pilgrims were the first, as they were being repressed. They came from East Anglia and settled in New England. Uh, during the Puritan Revolution, the Catholics and the Cavaliers fled and settled in the central uh, part of the, uh, the country and, and the southern part. Uh, later on, early in the 18th century, uh, the Quakers from northern England fled and settled in Pennsylvania. And later, the so-called Scotch-Irish, who uh, 
had experienced all the border wars in northern England, fled and settled in the so-called back country of uh, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and North Carolina. Andrew Jackson was a descendant of that group. So the point is that America was settled by a religious and political migration, and as opposed to an economic migration. So an economic migration is one in which poor people come, tend not to be educated. That's happening in, from Mexico, and it happened in the European migration at the turn of the century. Cuba would be a case of a political migration. In America, these were uh, the immigrants to America in the 17th and 18th century tended to be very well educated. Uh, many were ministers. They believed in education. And they started colleges when they came here. The Puritans or the Congregationalists were first. They started Harvard University in, eight, in uh, 1636. Christ and truth was the motto. No longer. Uh, <laughs> it's now, is it just Veritas now, I think? They took, was Christ and uh, Veritas. They took Christ off. 100 years ago or so. Anyway, uh, they founded Yale, founded Dartmouth. Quakers founded the University of Pennsylvania. Anglicans founded King's College, now Columbia and Princeton. Uh, Baptists founded Brown. So by the time of the Revolution, we had nine colleges, all founded by religious denominations of one kind or another, and all of which taught these, these two trains of thought, Protestantism and, and classicism. Now, what about this Whig Republican tradition? Where was that taught? Not everywhere, but in two places it was. Uh, almost accidentally, at William and Mary College, there was a Scotsman by the name of William Small uh, who taught uh, Locke uh, and uh, some of the Scottish and uh, English rationalists of the time who believed in limited government. Uh, somewhat foes of England. And at uh, Princeton, where John Witherspoon also taught, also a Scotsman, a minister, Presbyterian minister. And their two students were Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson at William and Mary, and James Madison at Princeton. So these two, probably more than anyone else in the colonial period, absorb the doctrines of uh, republicanism and limited government and natural right. So, uh, you know, Witherspoon and Jefferson, I think we could take to be poles of these two sides of the founding generation. Witherspoon, Presbyterian divine, believed in revelation, original sin, uh, did not believe in reason, believed in miracles, uh, and, uh, but nonetheless was a devout Republican. And of course, we have Jefferson on the other pole, a rationalist, a deist, a follower of the ancients, but in a somewhat more abstract way, a, uh, also devoted to Republican principles. It's very interesting, therefore, that uh, James Madison was both a student of Witherspoon and the closest friend and political ally of Thomas Jefferson. In other words, you have these two poles and you have Madison somewhat in the middle. And as some have suggested, Madison's, some of Madison's thoughts in The Federalist for example, ambition must be made to counteract ambition. Or uh, what is government uh, itself except uh, the greatest testimony to the, uh, the fallen nature of man? That some of these ideas were the kinds of ideas that he would have gotten from Witherspoon, but blended in with the Republican ideas that he would have gotten from, from Jefferson. So, you have these two trains of thought. Now, it's interesting, of course, that we cannot duplicate the position the founders were in. That's a challenge, I believe. The, cha the founders stood at the beginning of our era. They were half outside it, 
and somewhat half in it were in the regime in a way and don't have the perspective they had. But one important thing is that uh, their ideas were shaped to a large degree by, as I say, pre-Republican, pre-constitutional ideas. These are Protestantism and classicism. Uh, they had, as I say, one foot outside the regime and one foot inside as they founded it. Uh, Madison has this very interesting comment in Federalist 14 where critics were saying that the extended republic was impractical because no one had ever done it before. And there are no models in the ancient world of an extended republic. And he says, he writes, why is the experiment of an extended republic to be rejected because it may comprise what is new? Is it not the glory of the people of America that while they have paid a decent regard to the opinions of modern times and other nations, they have not suffered a blind veneration for antiquity? for custom, or for names to overrule the suggestions of their good sense, the knowledge of their own situation, and the lessons of their own experience. And as I say, perhaps it would be more correct to say that they had a foot in both, both worlds. In trying to draw lessons from the founders' education and their achievements, I think we should especially try to recall uh, the style uh, and depth of their debates. The educational part of it is great. But looking at the Federalists, one cannot help but be impressed with the clear-headed logic and respect for facts and argument that one sees in those documents. Uh, the authors, primarily Hamilton and Madison, take up every criticism that's lodged against the Constitution, and without any hyperbole or any personal attacks, they, caution, they, they patiently take those apart and answer them. It's a kind of a model of political debate that we don't see today. But it was instrumental in getting the Constitution ratified. If they'd resorted to some of the kinds of things we saw to see today, or some of the things that their, their opponents did, it's likely it could not have been ratified. So I think the style and deportment uh, of the founders is something that we ought to emulate in addition to the substance of their arguments. Of course, we know that Jefferson and Madison, once in retirement, turned their attention to creating the University of Virginia as a kind of Republican or Democratic university. And universities and colleges were cropping up all over the United States at this time. Uh, and uh, this project occupied most of Jefferson's attention from the time he left office till the time he died. Fortunately, the university was opened a year before he died in 1825. He prescribed, with Madison's help, a curriculum for the university. Surprisingly, that curriculum was heavily scientific. Out of the 10 fields that he laid down, six or seven of them were scientific. Physics, mathematics, zoology, uh, biology chemistry, and others. And of course, he did have a place for ancient history in government, law, and politics. And he prescribed a series of readings for the curriculum. He was very concerned about the so-called consolidationist uh, movement of the time led by John Marshall and the Federalist Party. And he wanted orthodox professors teaching the right approach to federalism and the interpretation of the Constitution. And uh, he, he it was important to get an orthodox professor. Uh, but he prescribed the Declaration of Independence, the Federalist Papers, uh, the Virginian and Kentucky Resolutions, a few other things, and surprisingly, Washington's Farewell Address. I say surprisingly because Hamilton drafted Washington's Farewell Address. And of course, Hamilton was their arch enemy. <clears throat> uh, but no sooner had the University of Virginia uh, been created, and then uh, Jefferson dies the next year, when a lot of the hopes and dreams of the founders uh, began to disintegrate. Maybe that's a strong word. They had, I think if they had the idea that the new republic was going to be one in which the, which would uh, 
replicate in a way the, the convention. Uh, the most highly educated, the most sophisticated uh, men would rise to the top. That is not what happened. As the country, <laughs> as the country moved westward uh, uh, and as new settlements developed, of course, the country became much more democratic, populist, and egalitarian, very much contrary to their expectations. Tocqueville writes about this, about equality of condition and democracy uh, in America. And as that happened, the, the classicism of the founding generation receded in popular and political culture and was limited pretty much to college curricula. However, evangelical Protestantism advanced very rapidly in that period. We know about the Second Great Awakening of the 1820s, uh, when new religions were invented, and when uh, ministers would ride the circuits preaching uh, at revivals to large crowds out on the frontier. That was, that was a dominant theme of that antebellum period. Uh, uh, the rise of Protestantism and the receding character of, of the classical example. Uh, I think Lincoln might be one of our best examples of that. Lincoln had almost no schooling. I think he went to one year of school. Lincoln, he was entirely self-educated. Uh, and of course there was no television. So there was not, for an intelligent person, there wasn't a lot else to do. But uh, Lincoln, so as far as we know, Lincoln did not read anything from the ancient world except Euclid. That would be a surprising uh, thing to have, to have read for someone. Of all the things one might read in the ancient world, Euclid. But Lincoln does talk in a lot of his debates about axioms and propositions. Uh, Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth in this continent a new nation dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal, the proposition. Some think he got that from Euclid. He read Shakespeare, uh, Macbeth, Hamlet, Henry IV, Othello. Uh, and uh, of course, he mastered the Bible. Lincoln was a free thinker, supposedly. He knew the Bible by heart, and he read everything the founding fathers wrote. So Lincoln's education was one in the Bible, Shakespeare, and the founding fathers. Uh, and one thing about Lincoln, and this is another thing I'd emphasize, this is true of both Lincoln and the Federalists. Uh, Lincoln mastered something that I would call political reasoning. I think this is very important for a statesman. I don't think you can learn it in school or in a classroom. You, education is important, but reflection on events and literature and so on is also important. And what do I mean by political reasoning? Political reasoning is the kind of thinking that you undertake when you say, if I do this, they're going to do that. And when they do that, I'm going to have to do this. I don't want to have to do that. Therefore, I'm going to have to do this and make them do that. And then I'll do that. Lincoln was a master at that kind of thinking. I believe that the authors of the Federalist Papers were also masters in this kind of thing. Madison, you can see him going through talking about ambition and the checks and balances. This is going to happen, and this is going to happen. And we can see this, this kind of thing working itself out. Uh, very few people have the ability to see the world as a kind of a chessboard with a lot of intricate pieces out there and a lot of moves to be made and the, the great difficulty of maneuvering through it. Lincoln said that the Civil War was a situation that was piled high with difficulty, which was absolutely true. But Lincoln found a way to maneuver through this, I think for the reason I just mentioned. One other thing about the Federalists and Lincoln is that I've already said that the Federalists seem to be somewhat clinical 
Madison especially, in their analysis of situations. An ability almost to stand outside the situation and look at it independently and objectively, as if one were not a participant in the situation. So, uh, you know, Lincoln, Lincoln, of course, in the debates with Douglas, really does master this situation. He's able to marshal these arguments, these complex arguments, without losing uh, his train of thought or uh, becoming over-emotional in the debates over slavery, as some people might do. Uh, he was extremely cool-headed. Now, I have this quote just to, to uh, illustrate this from the second inaugural address, this idea of standing outside the situation and looking at it as an observer. So you all know this. It was Lincoln's birthday yesterday. Uh, and on March 4th, it will be 150 years since he gave uh, the second inaugural address. Uh, so uh, let me just read this very quickly. On the occasion corresponding to this four years ago, all thoughts were d directed to an impending civil war. All dreaded it, all sought to avert it. While the inaugural address was being delivered from this place, not while I was delivering the inaugural address, while it was being delivered, devoted altogether to saving the Union without war, insurgent agents were in the city seeking to destroy it without war, seeking to dissolve the Union and divide effects by negotiation. Both parties deprecated war, but one of them would make war rather than let the nation survive, and the other would accept war rather than let it perish. And the war came. One-eighth of the whole population were colored slaves not distributed generally over the Union, but localized in the southern part of it. These slaves constituted a peculiar and powerful interest, and all knew that this interest was somehow the cause of the war. And then he goes on. Lincoln's writing almost like a historian who's writing 100 years after the event, not as a participant in the event. And uh, this is, this is one of the characteristics, I think, uh, that's quite, quite impressive about Lincoln, his ability to look at that situation. Of course, we all know that Lincoln delivered a speech in 1838, he's not even 30 years old yet, where he, he, he forecasts uh, the, almost the collapse of the Union due to slavery, and he fears that it'll be uh, that a dictator of some sort, like Napoleon or Caesar, will come in and take it over. He basically sees, even before the slavery controversy has uh, begun to explode, it's out on the horizon. He sees somehow that this is going to divide the Union. And as Edmund Wilson, the critic, says, Lincoln almost, when I was only 30 years old, imagines his own role in the unfolding of this epic situation. This is when he's only 30 years old. So, uh, somehow, this man, without a formal education, uh, was able to develop a kind of political wisdom that's uh, not only unusual, but almost unprecedented. So, the, the end of the Civil War and the assassination of Lincoln 150 years ago now, represents the end of the classical world of the American Republic. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, prior, prior to the end of the Civil War, if one wanted to look at the basic documents that define the Republic, those would all have been articulated by statesmen. The Declaration of Independence, the Federalist Papers, the Constitution, Webster versus Hayne, uh, Calhoun, uh, the Compromise of 1850, Lincoln and Douglas, Lincoln speeches. After this, at the end of the Civil War, if one were to try to develop a syllabus of American thought, one would be hard pressed to duplicate any of that work. Now, in the year, in the years after the Civil War, leading down to the present day, the Debate in America is not guided so much by politicians or statesmen. We don't even have that many uh, statesmen, but by journalists, 
academics to some degree, intellectuals, uh, not by statesmen. That aspect begins to recede in America after the Civil War. It's very, I don't have an explanation for it. Maybe we solve some of our basic problems with the Civil War. Maybe the rise of industry has something to do with it. The second point I would make is this. At, before the Civil War, the debates are constitutional. What did the founders intend? What does the Constitution mean? What's the nature of this union? Is this a confederacy that states can withdraw from? Or is it a union, a perpetual union of some sort? This, is, this they fight over. What's the authority of the federal government and so on? Afterwards, there, an ideological element is introduced into American political life. No longer rooted in the Constitution quite so much, or in the writings of statesmen, but in ideological agendas uh, set forth by political leaders of various kinds, party leaders and intellectuals. Now, here, the progressives are very important. Uh, and they begin to develop in the decades after the Civil War. Woodrow Wilson becomes really the first progressive. Maybe Teddy Roosevelt we could count as the first progressive to gain high office. Wilson articulates the views of the progressives more clearly than anyone else. But basically, the progressive view is that the Constitution is outdated. It's no longer appropriate or useful in a time of uh, industrial capitalism. It's OK for the 18th century and era of agriculture. But now, with the rise of big corporations, labor unions, uh, the rise of science, uh, the Constitution is outdated, really. We need to remake the Constitution. Of course, they do amend the Constitution, but basically, they want to think about the Constitution differently than they thought about it before. Uh, one of the ideas that they have is that the framers, let me see if I can find this quotation from Wilson, uh, the framers were Newtonian in their thinking. The Constitution was mechanical. And uh, really what we have today is a situation where a political life is evolutionary and historical. So here's what Wilson says in 1912. The makers of our federal Constitution read Montesquieu with true scientific enthusiasm. They were scientists of their kind. The fathers of the nation, Jefferson wrote of the laws of nature and of nature's God. And they constructed government as they would have constructed a machine. Politics in their thought was a variety of me mechanics. The Constitution was founded on the laws of gravitation, checks and balances. The government uh, was to exist and move by virtue of the efficacy of checks and balances. So Wilson's critique is that the, the framers saw the Constitution as a machine that would run on its own. I don't think that's right, but that's what he says. The trouble with the theory is that government is not a machine, but a living thing. It falls not under the theory of the universe, but under the theory of organic life. It is accountable to Darwin, not to Newton. This is Wilson. That's the, that's the theory of the so-called living Constitution. So. Uh, the basic idea there is that we don't have to look to the origins of the republic uh, to uh, discern its genuine nature. We have to look to the evolution of ordinary life. We have to look to history. We have to look to the future. Uh, we have to perfect this experiment in terms of democracy. So while, while many of us try to ground our thinking about America and its origins, the progressives and the liberals of the 20th century ground it in some notion of the future, where they're headed. But what does that mean? Where are we going? Uh, they don't exactly know. They also have the idea that education uh, should be organized for the purpose of democracy, and that education is a kind of a living form of democracy that when we go to school, we don't just learn from the teacher. We're engaged in a democratic experiment where we learn how to live with one another. And education is about solving practical problems, scientific problems, social problems, one kind or another. 
So they had a particular view of schooling, the progressive, we know about progressive education. And so far as colleges and universities are concerned, of course, they no longer want to look to the past, the ancients, the founding fathers, they want to look to the future. But now, they think that universities should be places where we train those government officials who staff the various agencies that will regulate the economy. And these universities will carry out the research that we need uh, to adopt wise and effective public policies. So the, the old idea of education for statesmanship and leadership gives way to a more technical idea where uh, political education is uh, for the purpose of designing more effective public policies. The horizons, in that sense, shrink. Now, we could ask ourselves, where does the current, uh, I'm tempted to call it a mania on the college campus for race, class, and gender, or for diversity or multiculturalism, where does that come from? I think that's a kind of an iteration beyond progressivism. Uh, the, those on the campus who've more or less taken the campus over in the name of these ideas see that the purpose of, col of colleges and universities is, is to somehow reform or transform the country. Uh, they're, and in fact, when they look to the past, when we look to the past, we see this great achievement of the founding fathers of Lincoln. They, of course, see this oppressive past that has to be overcome. Uh, his the history is bad. It must be overcome and reformed step by step. So they take, a, uh, they take a perspective on the past, which is extremely judgmental. Uh, it doesn't live up to their expectations, and therefore they reject it, and they basically discard it. As I say, that's a, a step beyond the progressives. It's kind of progressivism with a vengeance. Um, uh, so the question is, I suppose, and here's, I don't have a good answer, is what do, we, what do we do about this? These ideas have pretty much taken over the world of higher education. Uh, obviously, government has grown uh, in the 20th century to a great degree. And when we think about crisis, in the 19th century, you might have looked to a Lincoln or a statesman. Today, we look to economists. John Maynard Keynes will save us from the Depression. Uh, so we, we live in a different kind of world, so how can we recover this idea of statesmanship that we had and saw uh, 150 years ago and before? Uh, how do we make it effective out in the world? Now, here I don't have an answer, but I would say this, that the kind of education that you've received at Hillsdale and the great books and history, that's vital. On top of that, I believe it has to be augmented with the example of the founding fathers and Abraham Lincoln. This idea of mastery of the subject, being able to debate the subject, being able to stay in control to advance it, being able to see down the road as to where we're going. I believe that in America, we will face a crisis where this kind of learning uh, will be required to steer us through it. Indeed, I don't think it's all that far into the future. Uh, but I can't see that far into the future. But I believe an education for statesmanship is not something that we necessarily have to call on every day. Abraham Lincoln in uh, 1838 foresaw the Civil War. However, he was, I believe, content to be a country lawyer in Springfield for the rest of his life until the slavery crisis exploded in 1854 with the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. That event pulled Lincoln out of his private life and into the public debate uh, with enormous implication. So, uh, I think that the kind of education that we're talking about is not something that we can uh, necessarily use on a daily basis and in every controversy, but it's a storehouse of, of knowledge and wisdom that we can call on uh, when difficult occasions arise. 
And we'll be very fortunate as a people, especially the young people here, if you don't encounter such a crisis. Uh, and at that time, your education will be very valuable. And thank you. I'm Stu Reuter, and one of those Columbia grads you might have been uh, short sheeting. I have a somewhat complex question for you that arose during your talk. You talked about the right of revolution. Obviously, that was valid for the founders and not for Lincoln. At the same time, what about literacy rates during those periods? How many of the American revolutionaries were literate, how many, despite literacy, stayed on as Tories. And during the Civil War, I was greatly impressed by the literacy shown in the Ken Burns Civil War series, people with fifth and eighth, eighth grade educations that could probably out vocabulary half of the audience here. Your thoughts? Well, on the right of revolution, very interesting. Of course, the colonies seceded from Great Britain uh, and turned themselves into states and uh, under, the, under the right of revolution. Uh, is there a distinction between revolution and secession? You know, I, I haven't thought this through, but the lock contract theory uh, would seem to suggest in his right of revolution that revolution is justified, but secession is not. In other words, once you do the original contract, how do you get out of it? So that a significant part of the American Union thought this was a confederacy, and that when it was no longer serving their purposes, they could withdraw. That was a Southern view. And of course, Lincoln had a different view. So I, I can't answer that question, but basically, uh, our view today is that secession is not legitimate, where re revolution might be. Now, we have had secessions in the modern period. Um, but you know, one question one could ask about Lincoln is, as some critics say this, is that he established the foundations for what you might call an ideological state. What's an ideological state? An ideological state is one that's uh, dedicated to achieving some abstract goal. So the Soviet Union was an ideological state. Nazi Germany was an ideological state. France, after the revolution, ideological state. So yes, except you know maybe a religious state, but religious ideological. So is, is America that kind of state with its dedication to equality? So Lincoln does say in the Gettysburg Address that, you know, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now, uh, so I sometimes wonder about this contemporary emphasis on equality, even as it's articulated in these distorted ways about race, class, and gender, whether that is somewhat a fallout from this idea. I, I have, don't, haven't made up my mind on that. There are those who say that. You know, as to literacy, I don't know what the numbers were, uh, but as I, I say that America in the 18th century, the colonial world, was quite a well-educated world. Uh, even though schooling was not widespread, reading was widespread, and uh, college education was something that was highly valued. They created a lot of colleges. So, partly because, as I said, of this uh, uh, Protestant focus on maybe reading the Bible. Uh, everybody had to be literate. Uh, so uh, I don't know about the literacy rates were in the Civil War. Yeah, the Ken Burns thing is quite impressive about the letters that people wrote and so on. So you know, I think Lincoln is a good example of someone without schooling, extremely literate. Anyone?
Hi, Carl Golovin, JFKVigil.com. I would ask you to expound on your uh, your JFK writing, but I'm fascinated by what you brought up in the context of Lincoln and the reading of the Bible, because uh, Lincoln at one point supported a, a, in a, law, a litigation a former Roman Catholic priest named Chinique, who wrote that during the Civil War, Lincoln very intentionally resisted making it into a, quote, religious war involving Rome. Of course, the Pope of Rome had endorsed, written to Jefferson Davis, and the U.S. broke diplomatic relations with the Vatican upon the assassination and didn't restore diplomatic relations till, I believe, under Reagan in 84, 1984. Uh, can you comment on that? Uh, well, I, didn't, I didn't really know that uh, they, the U.S. broke off diplomatic relations after Lincoln was assassinated. Uh, I wasn't aware of that. Of course, there was an idea that uh, Lincoln's assassination had been a Catholic plot. I don't know if that was, uh, uh, if it was related to that. Um, so I, I can't, I can't really, uh, can't really comment on that. Uh, I, I don't know the facts of that. Interesting. Yeah, you you mentioned one interesting um, uh, thought that the founders had that uh, they they were worried about the the decline of virtue would mean the decline in the end of the republic, and they 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 noted this is what happened. And and I'm wondering what uh, Adams and Madison and Jefferson might think about the level of virtue in America today. And I'm wondering what you think about the level of virtue in America today. Obviously, there are many virtuous Americans, but do we have enough to continue this yeah. uh, republic? Well, you know, I'm sure they'd be disappointed in it. Uh, a lot of ways, the the general corruption in the government, I think they'd be somewhat shocked by. And but of course, the ethic, the ethic of today is different. We have a uh, that was that was a kind of a Protestant, uh, old school uh, culture that they lived in. Today, we have the idea that uh, people have to be liberated from social norms so they can express themselves. So uh, that, that ethic would be totally foreign to the founding fathers. Of course, Madison did say that a republic couldn't survive without a, a fair amount of virtue in the people. There's a kind of a back and forth. There was the idea that the Constitution itself was sufficient to protect the country against degradation of the kind you described, corruption and loss of virtue, that the machine, the Constitution, was sufficient. Madison does address this in the Federalist Papers, where he says it's not enough. The Constitution won't be enough. There has to be virtue in the people. Now, Lincoln essentially says, and I guess the events, events say it as well, that the original Constitution failed that the compromise, compromises that were supposed to be worked out weren't worked out. And, you know, Lincoln, to some degree, attributes it to money making. That is to say, slavery became so important because it was financially so rewarding. And therefore, people, and the Northerners were implicated in slavery as well because uh, we had all the textile mills in the North that was using Southern cotton. So uh, his idea was that we've kind of lost the purposes of the founding in our money-making mania. And that's why the, the union is coming apart. Uh, and of course, all of us are reluctant to be preachers. You know, we don't want to be judgmental in the modern day and talk about that kind of thing. But, uh, you know, none, nonetheless, uh, you know, it's there. I, I would say also, one thing I would worry about, and I didn't bring this up, is that I said that the uh, lock was not enough. Equality, representation, liberty, it's not enough to guide the private life. You need to look to other sources for that. But one thing I would worry about today is that these ideas are invading every sphere of life. Now, if you look to the colleges, what's the ethic of higher education? It is representation. The groups have to be represented. It's freedom of choice. I get to pick my curriculum. It's total freedom and liberty. If students do whatever they want, it's 
a kind of abdication of authority by the leaders. In a sense, it's, it's, the, it's the political principles of whatever we want to call it that are supposed to guide our political life. It's invading all spheres of life. So that institutions that are not fully equal or democratic or representative are viewed as illegitimate. Uh, and that's one of the things that's silently and quietly happening in modern life, I would say. I don't know how the Catholic Church is ever going to survive. Because once you start applying uh, those kinds of standards, the operation of a church, why, of course, it's pre-democratic. It existed for 2,000 years. But uh, how, does it, how does it survive in, an, in a political environment where it's judged by uh, those kinds of standards? Uh, I think it's going to be extremely difficult for it to do so. Um, so th th that's one thing that I, that I would worry about, as I see on the college campus, the invasion of private life by democratic political standards. 